So this is what I'm going to talk about today. I want to talk about genetic studies and respiratory control. And this is a talk that I used to get fairly, fairly regularly when I was, uh, when the animal laboratory was open. I, and uh, and it, it, we'll go through it and tell you what it's all about. So the themes are genetic dissection approaches, the phenotype, the phenotype, the phenotype, which is uh, timely, I think, because people talk about the endotype. And then the B6 mouse is a preclinical model of ventilatory instability. The B6 mouse is a strain of mouse that is commonly used in research for all sorts of things. It's the main, in the United States, it's the main mouse in which all knockouts are made. And uh, we're going to map a little bit and try to map this onto the causal pathways for OSA. So remember causal which I talk about is sleep, gain, anatomy, and pharyngeal muscle responses. So it's hard to, uh, oh, we've got morning for the dogs. I'm gonna close the, close the door for a second. All right, guys. Okay. And, um, what's, what's, Let's go. So I'm disclosure. I have NIH funds, I have Star Technologies, which is uh, a mouse ox, uh, Symmetrics, uh, Inspire. But I'm not going to talk about any of those. In the case, uh, we're going to start off with a 37-year-old male presenting complaints of daytime sleepiness, drowsy driving, restless sleep, and reports of snoring and pauses during sleep, obese, hypertension. Family history of loud snoring, cardiovascular disease, crowded fairing, short neck, trace breed, tibial edema. So obviously his risk factors would be male obese, craniofacial anatomy, and hypertension. So I can make a genetic case for each of those risk factors, and I can make a genetic case for them as being important. And uh, if I was able to get almost 50,000 people with obstructive sleep apnea, I could probably find genes that relate to all those things. And uh, if you were really going to do a lot of genetic dissection for each of those traits, you would sort of go to the literature and find that there are, you know, thousands of genes involved in obesity, many genes in craniofacial anatomy, many genes in the development of hypertension. And um, in terms of uh, sex, that uh, gen XY, you've got tremendous amounts of this. So I stuck my nose in genes for a long time. So I'm going to show you a videotape objective. And it's uh, really, again, uh, hold your breath as long as this kid does. Notice how the person sounds. Notice what happens. And uh, I don't know if it'll come across as being, you can hear it, but you've seen this before. And, uh, you know, when you're, when you're a doctor and you kind of look at these people and you say, well, you know, I, I don't know if I can fix them with genes, but I can certainly understand the origins of these diseases. But it's pretty complex. Person's asleep, they're having apneas, they're making all this uh, noise, they ha have all these causal pathways. You can see you just had a central mixed apnea right there. Stop breathing. Starts breathing again. So he has all these sorts of features that you can, you can look at. So what we're going to talk today about is how to dissect it out in use of animal models. Um, this is just a physiologic uh, measurements in humans of oxygen saturation, genu glossal EMG, rib cage abdominal motion, airflow at the nose and mouth, EKG. You can throw these all into some sort of huge data set and throw it against uh, all, the, all the different polymorphisms you can find. And, and that's what people are doing, actually. And you'll see if you go to genes and sleep apnea, you'll find associations with length of an apnea. You'll see associations with uh, oxygen saturation. You'll see associations with arrhythmias, all sorts of things. So the genetic of a complex risk for this sort of thing is based on anatomy, 
sleep, ventilatory control, and genes. And the thing that really got me going in 19, I guess it was 1993, 1994, is the realization that there would be genes that would increase and there would be genes that would decrease your, your, your possibility for having recurrent apneas. This had been shown for hypertension by a guy named Nick Shork, one of the first uh, kind of practical identifications and it was done in an animal model of spontaneously hypertensive uh, rats and then uh, control were, the, were rats that were not hypertensive and he could dissect out these various genes. And what determined your hypertension level uh, was your relative proportion of genes that might increase or decrease. Furthermore, the contribution of these genes uh, uh, changed along the life of, of, of the rat, or at least uh, along the, the, the course of, so that genes that might be the features that were, were linked to blood pressure at uh, three months were not the same genes that linked to blood pressure at six months in the same strain and even in the same mouse. So that there are two real dimensions to, to the genetics. One is the genetics that really comes with uh, your set point. That is when the sperm hits the egg, everything else is uh, environmental. Uh, and then the other are the way that the environment or, uh, affects the play out of genes and, and the relative influence of genes as your disease progresses. Um, that was pretty much uh, a kind of a, a epiphany for me to think about genes and think about genes and sleep apnea to the extent that I sort of gave up on humans because it was too complex and went back and looked at uh, rats and mice and, and uh, started looking at things with uh, Ted Dick and with, with uh, Frank and, and looked at mice. So the consequence genes for hypertension, heart failure, and stroke are the consequences. So if I wanted to look at sleep apnea and I said, oh, I want to take those people that are hypertensive or those that are heart failure and those with a stroke, those would be the consequences of, a, of, of sleep apnea. They're not causal. So then you have to remember that that's what's, uh, what's going on too. So is there a heritability to AHI? This was to twin studies as well as other studies in the family, Susan Redline, 1996. She did family studies in Cleveland and this comes from that data set. And that data set said if you had one person in your family, what was the likelihood of finding another person in the family, in your immediate family, uh, that would have sleep apnea? And then what if you had two people in your family? And then what if you had three? And you can see that there's a stepwise, a stepwise approach uh, of the finding of other people in your family that have sleep apnea. It doesn't tell you how they had it, didn't tell you what they had, didn't tell you the consequences, didn't tell you the, the causality, but that uh, this was really the first idea. It was also not strong enough, interestingly enough, to say if I diagnose somebody in the family with sleep apnea, that I should study everybody that are asymptomatic. And that continues to today, although that may change with now these biomarker approaches. The twin studies, if you had identical twins versus non-identical twins versus unrelated, you found about 50% of obstructive sleep apnea that was found in any particular adult age group was associated with uh, some sort of genetic uh, predisposition. Now remember all, if you took everyone with sleep apnea, the sum total of those, they can be thought of as being, being related to two features. One's your genes and one's your, your environment. So if it's not genetic, it's environmental. So 50% of this was really environmental and 50% was genetic. <clears throat> 
the aggregation index families changed according to whether you had an AHI of five or you had an AHI of 15, but it was still there. Segregation analysis at that time, 2002, showed that the Caucasians and Blacks were a bit different. And that goes with the idea that Caucasians and Blacks really are identified not necessarily by skin color, but by di different genetic pools. And so race is really a surrogate uh, at one point, bi or biologically, it's a surrogate a surrogate for uh, genetics. Now, you know, we, now we've gone beyond that and we can measure genes and we can look at inheritance and we can look at uh, nationality and we can look at all sorts of various things. But you have to think of, uh, uh, of blacks and BMI adjusted AHI. And, and this is really interesting is that there were some genes that were associated with AHI that actually went up when you adjusted for BMI. And these were the statistical insights that people had into parts of the genome that were, were, were related to this trait called apnea hypotony index, as imprecise as it is. So it's a complex disease. It means that there is the result of common mutations that are neither necessary nor sufficient, but interact to tip the balance toward illness. And you have static features, which are like anatomy, and you have dynamic features of sleep and respiratory control. And here's, here's a, Fong Han put this together. And, and this is, you've got at the bottom, you've got all these genes, I mean, all these genes, and then you've got protein cells and systems, and then they make risk factors, and then they go into these things that are causal, P-crit, loop gain, and then you get current apneas. And so the fact that you could find a gene statistically through this forest of interactions and this blizzard of, of, of of intersecting lines that go through all these actual uh, pathways. And remember these risk factors and cells and proteins, they go back to your genes and create epigenetic changes. And, and so it's just remarkable that you can actually find these things. Now, of course we have precedent in animal models like Drosophila that really sort of said, well, these are the principles of genetics. These are the principles of how you can manipulate it in animal models. And these are the principles on which uh, you need to understand uh, human biology. So is there value in animal models? Well, here are the two models that could be useful. Right? On the left is uh, the elephant seal, on the right is the, uh, is the bulldog. But uh, both of them are really hard to breed, hard to find genes. In order to find genes, you have to take uh, kind of two unrelated people and you have to cross them and then cross them again and then look at what the, uh, the gene segregation is and mix them up and match them. But these were animal models and, and physiology models. The, the, the elephant seal is interesting because it's evolutionarily uh, uh, designed to have obstructive apneas, mainly because it can't breathe underwater. So it closes its airway when it goes underwater and opens it up when you when you uh, go above water. So it's sort of like our, our guy that we saw, you know, he's coming up for air. And, and that's sort of one of the models that you have. And the other model is the bulldog, which was designed really um, by humans and bred by humans to be a cranial, mostly a craniofacial model. And, and that, but those were the things that people kind of looked at and designed and, and, uh, and looked at. So why, why the mouse? Okay, testing in the mouth, brilliant. These are old slides. <laughs> so how do you test the mouse? Well, you take this little plexiglass container, it's airtight, you can put air into it, you can put oxygen into it, you can bring air out of it, you can do a vacuum for rapid gas exchange, and you can create and look at breathing through a pressure transducer that's put into this sealed box. The animal is unrestrained, which means that uh, 
you don't have a lot of control, so you have to be patient and you have to catch them awake, catch them asleep, get them settled down, use a little animal psychology to get them to breathe uh, 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 quietly. And, and some people say that they, you, they get to breathe uh, the way you want them to, but uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a model. And I had a lab that they're going to be remodeling for another reason, but I had a lab at the VA that I wandered into about uh, 2002 and up until about 2018, that room was used for testing of mice and it was quiet and it was temperature controlled and it was ideal. So the challenge we uh, did uh, and we were doing at that time was uh, hypoxia and reoxygenation. You'd give them air, you give them hypoxia, and then you would reoxygenate. And, and down below is sort of the response in terms of ventilation, which is the V dot. And the top one is phrenic nerve activity. VT is tidal volume and frequency is um, FR. And you can see that what happens is that as you make an animal hypoxic, that the ventilation, the tidal volume, and the frequency kind of go up. And then uh, as you stop it, they kind of get back into steady state. But this is an interesting um, challenge. Uh, and it was originally used to look at something called roll-off, which is the change from the stimulus setting of hypoxia to, to when they went back to, to uh, breathing. And STP was really a sustained uh, uh, breathing that was higher than, than uh, how long was the breathing sustained. It's, it's not like an on and off switch. It's, it's, you rev this thing up and it, and it keeps going. And in this particular instance, you can see with phrenic nerve activity that there's a big, the little ticks at the beginning is the phrenic nerve bursts and then it becomes higher and much more dense. But when you reoxygenate, it becomes slow and high. And so this respiratory control system is quite uh, interesting from that point of view. And this is what Ted was talking about last week. This is all happening within the brainstem. This is all happening within the brain. And if you then map this out on the sleep apnea, which is on the top there, you've got this hypoxia and reoxygenation. And you can imagine now you make somebody hypoxic with an apnea and then you have them respond by over breathing and then they reoxygenate and then if that sets off this slowing i mean these things are were intuitively kind of appealing to be able to understand sleep at so that's what we did so these are points of rapid gas exchange and these points of rapid gas exchange so we had a young guy named Fong Han in the lab and he came over for two years and we, I put him down there with Ted because Ted was there every day and Ted could talk to him about stuff and he was doing, Ted was doing the rats and we were doing a little bit of uh, strain differences in rats and breathing during anesthesia to see how it was affected by it all. And we had some people upstairs that had different strains of mice. And so we started to do some, some mice and, and Ted uh, was down there and, 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 and you kind of look at this mouse. So you take this mouse and you make them hypoxic and then you reoxygenate. All right, now we get to our main players. The B6 is a black six and the AJ is a white. And I really wished that traits would track with skin color, but they don't. And on the top thing, you see air baseline. They have a different breathing pattern. And every individual has their own individual breathing pattern. But remember, these are, these are strains of mice, and these are all twins. These are all identical mice. So you could get B6 mice that are almost identical from one year to the next. If you make them hypoxic, the B6 has seemed like you have a higher tidal volume, a little slower frequency than the AJ. 
but it was on reoxygenation that the B6 really slowed and the AJ hardly did much at all. And then this is the most a dramatic example. You always pick one and you look at it in the B6. And there was, a, there was a time for about 30, 40 seconds where this B6 has pretty interesting breathing patterns. And the AJ um, doesn't do much irregular breathing. And they have similar lung and chest wall mechanics. They had a similar peak crit. They had an injection fraction that was similar. They're different in terms of what their heart is. They're different in terms of what their lung volumes are, but their mechanics are about the same. So Maduri, what's the B6, what's the trait in the B6? Sort of looks like chain Stokes, doesn't it? So anybody yeah. have an idea about this thing? Yeah, it looks like chain Stokes. Right, and so what would be the mechanism of chain stops? It's loop gain. So we got a loop gain mouse. Yeah. How about that? But you have to set it up. You have to set it up by making them hypoxic and reoxygenating them and, and doing this. So we, we had to prove that to a bunch of people. That took probably three or four years, all sorts of things. So now all of a sudden we have a mouse that can mimic some features. Now these were, we could show and we could look at this and we could say what was happening. But these were generally, these, the, or these were apneas in which the animal did, was not closing the airway. Rats and mice hardly ever close their airway unless you really, you know, make them porky, you know, really make them fat. And these were not terribly fat. All right, <clears throat> now this is in 2001. <clears throat> we published uh, first the post, the reoxygenation differences that there's a post hypoxic ventilatory decline or frequency decline in the B6. There's no such thing in the AJ. And then, then we went on to show a model of periodic breathing. So how do you dissect a complex trait like post-hypoxic pauses? So we were fortunate we had a fairly, well, we had an extremely strong group of people in the genetics department led by Joe Nadeau, who had different strains of mice. And one of the strains of mice was called the chromosomal substitution strain. They had bred strains of mice in which they could take or eventually enrich a, a mouse to have a, a chromosome from the AJ onto a B6 background. Turned out to be, <clears throat> that was a lot easier than doing it the opposite, but there are now several strains of chromosome substitution strain. So that what these strains differed by was a single chromosome. So for instance, you could have an AJ, a, a B6A1, which was uh, the chromosome one of the, of, the B, of, of, of the AJ onto a B6 background. Now that's the value of animal models. You can create these sorts of unique genetic structures and the fact that they could live is means that they, they, and they can breed, that that means that they're okay. Doesn't mean they're normal, doesn't mean, but they're not bizarre animals. They're not, you know, doing anything really, really odd. And so if you took then each of these strains and you looked for the parapresence of recurrent post hypoxic apneas, you could sort of say, well, Maybe there's uh, this gene is important and that, or that, this chromosome is important and this. So it's sort of like a, a 20 questions, right? Is it on this chromosome or is it on that chromosome? And you don't have to worry about what gene it is, but you would say what chromosome. So that was the advantage of that particular approach. So we've done a bunch of things. So 
Now, another guy, Motu Yamuchi, came, came into the lab after, after uh, Fan Han and looked at a whole series of chromosomal substitution strains. And if the B6 had like 12 pauses in 10 minutes, and the AJ had less than one or less than in, in, in 10 minutes, the B6A1 had something right in the middle. And we had also learned at that time that we could give buspirone to the B6 and get and, 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 and get rid of those pauses. So we knew we could modify it by a pharmacology. So AJ chromosome one offers partial protection and so does buspirone. So I just jumped from 2002 to 2008 and you can imagine that there was a lot of work going on in that. And it was pretty good funding, pretty good funding. Although, Physiologists are generally allergic to genetics. They don't like to think that there's variation in their trait. They don't like to think that if a mouse has one breathing pattern, that another strain of mouse has a different breathing pattern. And it kind of, and, and they could be healthy. But that's really what we're looking at. <clears throat> we're looking at what is the fundamental wiring of these of these two mice that produces a pauses in the B6 and no pauses in the AJ. And we could modify it by uh, these drugs. All right, chromosome one and APOA2. So I'm jumping again now to tw 2012. And we what we did is we took the B6, we crossed it with a, a B6A1. And then we bred those together. So the first, the first generation of a cross between a B6A1 and a B6, uh, each parent has an allele from each of those, those strains. But if you cross them again and you look at 200 animals, you find that they do with, with you know, the, 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 these genes segregate <clears throat> in such a way that they all break up. <clears throat> and you can look for areas of the of chromosome one. So now <clears throat> the beauty of this was <clears throat> we were going just to chromosome one. We didn't ha <clears throat> have to worry about any other chromosome because they were, <clears throat> all the rest were B6, but the AJ chromosome one was split up many, many ways in the second generation, in the grandchildren of these two strains. So there's a way of looking at these and you cut the, up the, the chromosome one. We only had to worry about all the alleles on chromosome one and you put them out and you look for an LOD score. So let's look at this a little more. A shows the breathing examples in the B6, which is a pause, and the B6 with an AJ chromosome, AJ1, and it's breathing pretty regularly. <clears throat> and then B is this pause phenotype mapped against chromosome one markers. And you look up at this thing, uh, two dotted lines are areas of significance. And you say, oh, there's a region in there that looks pretty good. And we could get these markers in there, C. And you can see that there's a bunch of markers in there. And, and, and people would do all these markers and they get all excited. They say, oh, this is this, that, and the other. And in this particular instance, there were seven, uh, we called it the stability region. That is, this region determines stability or instability in this, uh, in this intergenerational cross. And then we took that, that kind of area and we actually bred it back onto a B6A1. This was, a, this is the Carl Gilombardo did this. He's now a, a cardiology fellow over at UH, but he did this. It was hard work. I mean, you know, you had to figure out what it is. You had to figure out where these, uh, these genes were. You had to be able to do it. And once he bred it back into a, a, a B6A1, remember a regular breather, he could get that pause phenotype back. So that proved it was a genetic element rather than some sort of like 
susceptibility to something in the laboratory or whatever it was. And then we looked at the gene expression arrays. You've heard of the messenger RNA expression arrays and these expression arrays you can get on and you learn about it in, 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 in medical school. I, I, we learned about it in medical school, but it was in the, it was in a real snoozer lecture on genetics. And now I think they do a lot more, but it's still a kind of a, what is this and how is it going to make us, make us uh, better doctors? But really, you know, we looked at gene expression arrays and it was APOA2. Okay. So what's APOA2? Well, APOA2 is apolipoprotein A2. And its notoriety is that it's the second uh, most abundant apolipoprotein in the circulation and it carries cholesterol. And that's why it says, huh. It says, huh, because it's not anything anybody ever expected. But remember, this is not the, you know, this is, this approach is trying to find genetics. It's not trying to make a better watch. So whatever this particular polymorphism is in this APOA2, it ended up in this B6 mouse and a different one was in the AJ mouse. And it, de it determined something to make sure that your breathing was either regular or irregular after a hypoxic reoxygenation trick that Dr. Stroll does in his laboratory. I mean, I don't think any of these animals ever experienced that. They didn't evolve to be able to be in the laboratory and be in these little boxes. But the trick was exposed by doing that particular test on a routine basis. And we could determine to some extent uh, that this was APOA2. So is this really true? Uh, it turns out to be apolipoprotein A2. It's made in the liver, second most abundant carrier protein, human and mouse SNPs associated with cholesterol levels of metabolism. Three human cohorts report APOA2 uh, with a high fat diet interaction on obesity, that is you have a certain polymorphism in humans and you eat, uh, you have fatty foods and you get obese, but there's no known role of production in the brain. I mean, I don't think your liver is going to be causing this thing. So we found that it had a recessive inheritance. And this is a uh, 2017, and this is uh, in Ted, uh, the first is these examples of these breathing patterns with a wild type or heterozygote and a knockout. So these are, we now manipulate the gene itself in the B6. B is what's called Poincaré plots, which are an instantaneous frequency of one frequency against the frequency of the next one. And you can see that your regular breathing has this the, uh, along the line of identity, which is that white line going through there, that there's a lot of a lot of mischief in there, a lot of things going around, and the heterozygote is sort of a little bit uh, better, and the knockout is about the same as the heterozygote. Pauses by genotype, the heterozygote and the knockout are about the same. So. So what's interesting is that the brain and liver and brain and liver, it, 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 there are very, uh, I don't, I can't really go into it a lot, but it's really interesting that you, in order, it looked like what you have to have is you have to have expression uh, or, or whatever its effect is in the brain. So this is where uh, Ted comes in with his uh, in situ preparation. So you take a perfused in situ preparation of the brain in a B6 mouse, and then you take the knockout mouse in A. So that's this, this phrenic nerve activity is gonna be what you're measuring. So 
can we prove it's somehow in the brain this way? Well, the fictive breathing patterns, mainly fictive because you don't move any lungs, you don't move anything. You find that that particular pattern is on the top is the wild type. And on the bottom, it's the knockout. And, and if you then look down at, uh, at the, the cycle durations in C and the timing of the total timing, you find a lot of variability in the wild type and very little in knockout. And then you look at these uh, these distributions of, of the total of, of, of T tote, that is the cycle of breathing, and they're a little different. And then you look at your Poincare plots, that is one frequency against the next. And the knockout is very restricted compared to the wild type. So you've got this happening in the brains. All right. So the working hypothesis is APOA2 affects general synaptic function. So in the periphery, where it had been looked at, it, it gets cholesterol. It goes uh, and it's made sort of in the liver and it helps traffic your cholesterol. But it turns out to be this APOA2 probably works in this cholesterol in the brain. And so that brings up a big area that has, that I continue to kind of poke at because very, everyone thinks of Alzheimer's disease and APOE, but this is APOA2. Turns out to be there's some connection with Alzheimer's, but not very strong and not strong enough to make a, a neuroscientist believe that they should fund some pulmonary guy to look at the at APOA2. But we think somewhere along this line in the ponds that there's synaptic chatter there. And you can imagine all sorts of models that you can have there. I mean, does loop gain, if that's really loop gain, that that Maduri looked at. Is that loop gain really exist in the ponds or is it part of the entire whole animal? Or maybe just probably, probably the best way of thinking about it is some little piece of that, of that loop gain exists in the brain. All right. So what about this thing about weight? Well, it turns out to be the knockout gains less weight in a high fat diet, but the apnea trait persists. So we took the uh, observations that were there in humans, that if you had an APOA2 particular polymorphism and you had a high fat diet that you would gain more weight. And sure enough, um, on a low fat diet, they gain weight about the same. So this is from three weeks to 20 weeks. But on a high fat diet, that, that wild type uh, gained more weight. On the other hand, they had more uh, post-hypoxic uh, pauses on low or high fat. So the, the diet didn't really create this pause phenotype. And that's still unpublished. So what does APOA2 tell us about what to look for in humans? Anatomy, sleep, and control, gender, genes, so APOA2 uh, turns out it might affect your body mass and your peak crit, but it also might affect your loop gain and perhaps it even works on sleep and arousal. I mean, I could start to think of this thing about you're born with this polymorphism of APO uh, lipoprotein A2 and that that gives you an inherent instability of your breathing and that instability of your breathing may or may not affect you throughout your life lifetime. Maybe you get a high fat diet, you gain some weight, your peak grit increases, and all of a sudden you start snoring and you start having apnea and as you get older. That would be a hypothesis. It's hard to test. Uh, sleep apnea model in the mouse is a central apnea, not obstructive apneas. But, uh, you know, I'm stuck right now at this particular juncture. 
until something comes up that gets people interested in ApoE2 in the brain. So now all the clinicians there, all the people out there, especially all the new fellows that sit there and go, what the heck is he talking about? And how does this relate to breathing and sleep apnea and me in my clinic? Well, Yamuchi was one of the guys that went back into Japan and said, I got some good ideas. And so he went back and he took this concept back and he said, we've got this sleep threshold gain in anatomy and pharyngeal muscle response. Now remember, we, we, we went on to show that this breathing per pattern in the B6 persisted into sleep, but we knew it happened during wakefulness. So he said, well, why don't I look at it in people during wakefulness? So using the assessment of breathing irregularity during wakefulness in a diagnostic PSG, and the idea that maybe breathing behavior infers loop gain. Now you have to realize that, um, you know, looking at PSGs is pretty boring, particularly, and, and getting them is a test that the technicians want to get people to sleep as quickly as possible. But he was able to get a data set of about 300 sleep studies in which there was at least five minutes of wakefulness before they went to sleep. And you see that. You see that sleep latency is being pretty long sometimes in people. And in which they had good five minutes or so of breathing that looks like it's, it's you know, it, it's not too bad. They're just quietly awake, maybe eyes open, maybe eyes closed, but they're just, they're just sitting there in the, in the sleep lab and they're breathing and you pick those out and you look at them and you kind of measure them and you see them and you start looking at them. And just as we were looking at our mouths breathing, you all of a sudden see that everybody has a little different breathing pattern. And here, here's the RIP, which is this respiratory inductive plethysmography during wakefulness. And he puts it into two groups. He had three groups, actually. Yeah, but this one is mixed apneas. And that is that most of the apneas, more than 50%, were mixed apneas. That is, they started with a central component, and then they went to obstructive. And the other were pure obstructive apneas. And these are breathing during uh, wakefulness. And these were people that had an AHI at least over 20 when they were asleep. And these are a couple examples. And, and you just eyeballed it and you said, boy, those are different. So how do you put a number on it? Well, he put coefficient of variation. He also used some other uh, terms to, or another, uh, other approaches to, to statistically look at it, but mostly tile volume and frequency. And you could look at the variation. And the variation number is coefficient of variation, which you have a mean and a standard deviation. And so you have the, the standard deviation over the mean is your coefficient of variation. And if it's big, it means that there's a wide variability. And if it's low, so you can see that the pure OSA group, the obstructive apnea dominant OSA, has much less variation than these other two examples. And he looks at this and he does it in a whole variety of people. And he uh, looks at tidal volume and, and frequency and finds that in both instances, controlled coefficient of variation in people that didn't have uh, sleep apnea is somewhere around oh, 15 and it's like uh, 30 or so in mixed OSA and then pure OSA, it's around the same as, um, as controls. You use sample entropy, which is another way of looking at the respiratory signal which, uh, without, without making a distinction as to whether that signal is coming from tidal volume or frequency, and you can find it's a little bit higher as well. So he concludes that you can sort of see the coefficient of variation leads you to have much more of a central component. He went on to look at adherence and found that in adherent people, 
they generally had uh, with even if they had OSO, uh, they had uh, if they were adherent that they uh, they had less variability of their breathing during wakefulness. So that forms a basis of what Anna May is looking at in terms of breathing variability and its ability to be cha changed by trazodone as a feature in adherence, adherence to uh, sleep app. All right, so the road ahead, we want to use the B6 as a preclinical model and greater understanding of the role of APOA2 in the brain, specifically a central pattern generator. And we want to look at uh, these in people. And I want to acknowledge all these people that were involved in these, the research itself. And I'm going to leave this slide, the last slide up, because that's really the cognitive map of what I uh, do in the laboratory and what how I think scientifically about, uh, about evolution and the evolution of physiologic principles. Thank you very much. You can see here that I don't have anything that looks at all physiological. It's all decision making and processes and genes and environment, but it's a useful heuristic and it comes from the evolution of, uh, of behavior in, uh, in bees. So you want to know what I think about sometimes. I think about bees. All right. I can't hear anybody. Okay, so uh, King Minal, uh, very nice talk. Uh, this is Ted. Yep. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> I was just wondering, in terms of th this this being a behavior, and all these are sort of high level decision making processes. I know we've talked about uh, in the past. This guy, and I know that uh, uh, this is not to antagonize anything, but the idea of just simply understanding a little bit more detail in the in the uh, in the structure of the uh, network during the Shane Stokes breathing pattern or during these long pauses. The idea is that expiratory activity does the pattern generator fall apart. What's going on in, in, the, in the long pauses of these animals uh, that we did with the crosses? Well, I, you know, I, I just, I, I, this is, the, you know, when I, when I talk about these things uh, or think about these things, I, I, I'm, I'm struck by the idea of uh, these kind of these butterfly effects and that, yeah. and that, you know, you may get into areas, uh, I don't think of it being, I, I think it's like ventilatory arrhythmia. Like cardiac arrhythmias, that you have reentry, you have all sorts of things going on, and that's what's going on in the brainstem. And then maybe it's part of, you know, some part of this instability that eventually goes to chain stokes. Now, remember this example, the initial example was really a cartoon. I don't see that very often. Mm. So it's, it, it, and, and so I think it's really this this uh and i don't know if instability is good or bad in this instance they both survive they both have that they they each of them have developmental sorts of things yeah we assume instability is is bad but i was just wondering but some some instability may you know you can tolerate right yeah yeah if you don't if you don't have a thumb on one hand you still can do stuff right right not much <laughs> No, you can still I said one hand. I said one hand. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. Gangman, this is Dennis. Hey, I got a question about the um, APOA2. Yeah. Um, since it's made by the liver, do we know what happens in patients with liver disease? And then does that affect their breathing? Well, I, th I think, it, well, we know it's made in the brain. We, we showed it the proteins in the brain, and we think it's both in, it's, it's mainly in glial cells, and we think it's a transport protein for cholesterol in the brain. 
Okay. And your glial cells make most of your cholesterol in your brain and your, your, your brain is like 65% cholesterol. <laughs> so it's really an area that hasn't gotten a lot of attention. Now, whether or not the liver disease itself that, cause we, it's, it's not thought of that APOA2 travels from the periphery and it goes into the brainstem and does things. Okay. It's locally, it's, it's oh, at local. least that would be the local production of things. Now, you know, I, 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 uh, you know, I proposed and never got funded to do mice that had just brain, you know, knockout of APOA2 or overexpression of APO, APOA2 and, and and, you know, it just never got, never got traction. Is there a clinical correlate of that in humans? Of APOA2? Yes. And that was the, those are the polymorphisms that were found important in uh, the Mediterranean diet. I mean, in the brain. It rep, replicated in three. So, but no one's looked at breathing in, the, in those. And, and one of the, one of the other things, and you, you can't put humans and animals in the same one and it came out of left field as I would do. Uh, so if I had a respiratory control laboratory and uh, I had um, 200 people, I would, uh, I would do their genetic testing for APOA2, sort them in their polymorphisms and test them for CO2 and hypoxic responsiveness but I'd also make my hypoxic and rip it away and see what their breathing stability was all about. Okay. Thank you. It was a good talk. All right, stunned silence, is that correct? Yeah. Stunned. So the, the other thing, Moshe, you're on, there's a very interesting developmental approach is that these B6 mice have lots, uh, lots more apneas when they're younger. And then as they get into juvenile, uh, they have, they get down to a kind of a lower level. And that's what we were studying is a lower level of instability. And then as they get really old, they get a higher level of instability. And that was shown by, uh, by people in France. And the, F, the FJN, which is the, the preferred model in, in Europe for doing knockouts uh, versus the B6. And, and so the other thing that happens is that when people do models of disease, like, uh, uh, let me see if, I, see if I can think of, but what you do is they usually do models of disease in, in, and look at breathing in, in the mouse. They usually use a B6 mouse. So it's a irregular breather to begin with. And certain, certain people have picked up on that. And it, but it took like eight years for someone to, sort of say, yes, you're correct, that they breathe irregularly, because they all thought it was a trick. That is interesting, and it would be, um, I haven't looked into the top topic in terms of basic science uh, mechanism thing yet, but in terms of, uh, you know, human neonates and their sort of, in, uh, I guess, relative instability compared to uh, adults, that'd be an interesting topic to look into more. Yeah, I think he could probably take APOA2 uh, polymorphisms and look the in quiet, in quiet wakefulness and quiet sleep uh, for five minutes. And, and but it would be much more kind of a physiology study and a proof of principle. But uh, one of the first people to look at the individuality of breathing was a guy named Abe Guz. He took just measured breathing patterns, tidal volume, um, frequency, TI, T-tote, flow patterns, and realized that uh, people that were identical twins were much more similar than non-identical twins. And they were uh, both those types of twins were even uh, less likely to be similar to people who were not related. So there's a, you know, 
if I if I had to put a, a little, you know, what did I show in my in my research? Well, not all not all mice breathe the same, but at least I know one gene that that, that determines that. And I don't make terribly much distinction between basic research and and this because you go up and down this ladder. I mean, what we had, um, you know, Litvin has some preliminary data suggesting that there's some synaptic uh, connections that are different in the ape in the knockout versus the wild type. So it may be a, a fair, and you, when you, once you think about it, you, you, you want to have these subtle changes in the background that build up to produce disease in, in adult humans. Cause you don't want to, you know, in adults, you don't, you, you know, you don't, you don't want to have a gene that kind of makes them not reproduce. <laughs> yeah. And, and Kingman, if you have that data, that's directly related to gain issues. You know, the idea that uh, Lipton looking at that synapse between the primary afferent and, and, and the uh, cell receiving the input. And um, if there are differences, it could relate to the differences in the gain. Of, of yes. The yeah, I call it gain now rather than loop gain, because I think loop gets everybody all loopy. <laughs> 